10 games that killed the entire franchise. Let's get started off with number 10 and talk about Medal of Honor. This is oh, a no, that's so sad. classic World War II shooter franchise. I mean, it was like kickstarted by freaking Steven Spielberg from the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 era, the Medal of Honor game. This video is going to make me so sad. I have a personal attachment to Medal of Honor. Games lived a wonderful life. They were incredibly fun, cinematic, first person shooter war games well before you had a solid Call of Duty campaign or anything like that. Medal of Honor was crushing it with score by Michael Giacchino, who is now famous for doing like superhero movies to really incredible still memorable depictions of stuff you'd see in war movies like Saving Private Ryan. Like Saving Private Ryan is my favorite movie of all time. And I have a personal attachment to Medal of Honor because when I was a child, when I was literally five years old, the only video game that my dad ever played was Medal of Honor Frontlines and Medal of Honor Rising Sun. And me being a five-year-old, I had tiny pea brain. I didn't know how to use a controller. So I'd be trying to play the game. I couldn't do it. And my dad, he'd come along and say, like bellowing from the heavens, as just as I die, he'd say, don't worry, let me give it a shot. And I'd say, oh, okay, dad, there you go, use a controller. And he'd play on airplane mode. He'd play on inverted. And it, I couldn't wrap my head around it. But I watching my dad, like, shoot people in Medal of Honor was essentially like watching John Wick on two times speed in steroids. It was... Even though he was probably awesome at the game, he probably sucked at it, but watching him play was like an assassin. A trained assassin. Trained in... <laughs> for 20 years in the Jedi Temple. And I'll never have that experience ever again, and it makes me so sad, but those were the games that shaped my childhood in terms of first-person shooter, and to know that the entire series is dead now because of the new one fills me with so much sadness. Storming the beaches of Normandy, yeah, Medal of Honor did that and they crushed it in video game form. From the Pacific Theater to Nazi intrigue, all kinds of stuff, they really had it going on for a while. And then, it seems like when Call of Duty and Battlefield really started to pop off, Medal of Honor kind of fell to the wayside. But around 2010, it's when EA really tried to revitalize things and kick Medal of Honor into the modern age, so to speak, with 2010's Medal of Honor and then 2012's Medal of Honor Warfighter. And the problem with these games is that they were half-assed and just so, so painfully generic. Now, they had their moments. Well, this was when all the games, all the game companies were making these dark, gritty, realistic shooters, except every single company made it. For every Call of Duty and for every Battlefield, there's about 7,000 other first-person shooters that got the release that everybody immediately forgot about because it was all dark, gritty war where you go in and there's tanks and you shoot enemies from a certain country. We won't tell you which country though because we don't want to, you know, we, we don't want to start something here, but they're from a country and they're the bad guys and we're the good Americans. Also, a lot of these games are just like American propaganda where you play as the good guys, which are just the Americans or the British and they go and shoot the bad guys, which are usually like Russians or Chinese. <laughs> it's kind of crazy you, propaganda. Medal of Honor Warfighter, which I do remember reviewing back in the day, not for game ranks, but somewhere, uh, actually had some surprisingly good driving sections, but otherwise, these modern revamped Medal of Honor games were like totally all style, no substance. On the surface, they looked pretty good, but once you actually got to playing one, there were so many other games just doing this stuff better at the time, and they totally ate Medal of Honor's love. 2012 had Medal of Honor Warfighter come and go and quickly be for I don't remember this game being released. He said Medal of Honor Warfighter and I'm like, what in the goddamn is a Medal of Honor Warfighter? Anything about Medal of Honor since. Then, I mean, to be fair, in 2010 there was Medal of Honor <laughs> Above and Beyond, the Oculus Wait, VR what is this? game. Uh, by a VR Respawn. game? No, how the, you know when you release a VR game, it's over for that series. Even Half-Life. Like, you know you're not gonna get, you're not getting Half-Life 3. They released Half-Life Alex. Half-Life 3 is never gonna happen. It's dead. The series is done. It's over. Of all people, but that didn't necessarily take off. And after that, and considering this was a pretty expensive VR game to make, we don't know if the Medal of Honor franchise is ever really gonna see a resurgence. I mean, I don't understand this obsession with VR games. I really don't get it. Maybe it's because when I put a VR headset on, I immediately get motion sick and it sucks and I hate VR with a burning passion because it just makes me sick all the time. I wish I could enjoy VR. Because it seems so fun, it seems so cool to like wiggle your hands around, like Beat Saber looks really fun to play. I don't get it, why everyone invests so heavily into VR. There can't be that many people with VR headsets that play VR games regularly, right? I can imagine that it's a really cool niche that people who enjoy that kind of thing, they really get into it and they'll probably buy all the VR games. But there can't be that many VR enjoyers. 
Are there? Are there a lot of VR enjoyers? It just feels like it's not something that's that popular. Nothing is ever really dead. They could bring it back and drag it out in a couple more years and maybe do it right. But for now, Medal of Honor is definitely sleeping with the fishes. So Next sad. I'm nine, devastated about Ninja that. Ninja Gaiden 3. Oh, man. Do you remember this one? Leading up to it, it seemed like it was going to be pretty awesome. All those cool new weapons, the kind of visual style, the game's cover art. Like, it just seemed Oh, this came really out and people cool. hated it. People were obviously really excited, specifically because the last two Ninja Gaiden games were great. They were incredibly challenging. Really it looks like a bootleg games, Devil May Cry. We still talk about Ninja Gaiden and Ninja Gaiden Black all the time here if you watch Game Ranks every day. Man, the lead up to Ninja Ninja Gaiden 3 was so exciting, and then when this thing dropped in 2012, it got a lot of bad reviews. I think This was the first Ninja Gaiden game in like forever, wasn't it? Because Ninja Gaiden was hugely popular back in the old days on the old 2D consoles with pixel art because it was impossible to beat. And then they released this, the first one in ages, I guess just to capitalize on the IP that they hadn't used in forever, and they made it look like a bootleg version of Devil May Cry remember a really crushing one from Giant Bomb. I'm gonna fill up my water bottle and make Hot Pockets. Can you please pause the stream for about five minutes? Yeah, sure, all right. Uh, hold on. Hey Siri, set a timer for five minutes. All right, uh, yeah, just, yo, just let me, just let me know when you're back. Uh, yeah, I'll just wait. Where they gave it like a two out of five stars. Overall, nobody Ooh, was really happy nasty. with it. I remember personally after, it just felt like regular old generic video game stuff. And along with that, the game just lost a lot of its identity. It felt really handholdy. A lot of people had- Dude, this looks like Batman kind of Arkham Asylum. And stupid. The game had your typical quick time events, which were popular at the time. And just something was really Oh, Wolverine. The soul of Ninja Gaiden here wasn't quite right. And again, it's just so jarring because the first two Ninja Gaiden games were so tight. Those were solid video game as video games with challenge, secrets, nuance, and Ninja Gaiden 3 just kind of felt like a cheap clone, a cheap knockoff. Uh, now they then tried- There's no way they got the same developers that worked on the original Ninja, Ninja Gaiden to make this, or at least the same writers or the, or the same producers to put it in the right direction. They probably just had access to the IP and they were like, ooh, we should make a Ninja Gaiden game because Devil May Cry kind of popular. Fixing it with the Razor's Edge re-release, but for most people, it was way too little, way too late. Oh, uh, and then after that, I mean, are we even going to get into this? They put out Ninja Gaiden what Yaiba. And what? Like, that was even worse. Technically, that? that wasn't like a main entry in the series, but still, it definitely didn't hurt things. Really? No, from my perspective, Ninja Gaiden is a series that came out in like the 80s, had some banger games that were impossible to beat and then disappeared, never to be seen again. Ninja Gaiden 3 was where a lot of things seemingly died. I still think the original two games, and I mean the classic franchise before it, are still good enough that eventually we might see something again but as of right now ninja gaiden is kind of dead and it pains me to say that like it just doesn't feel right they made one and two really next over at number that's eight, crazy command and conquer four which if you ask certain people they say it was kind of the last gasp of the good series i mean command and conquer as a brand still exists today they roll it out for certain things but i love command and conquer because they work in these live action shots in with the actual gameplay they just film like live action cutscenes instead of animating it and there is a really good one this is the best video game cutscene of all time commander you've reigned on my glorious parade for this i'm sending everything i've got at you but i won't let you have the satisfaction of catching me i'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been dropped in my capitalism Space! <laughs> he acts it so well. It's so goofy and I love it. I, oh, it makes me sad. I played one Command and Conquer game and it was this one. It was Red Alert. Such a funny game, dude. Oh, it's fantastic. The original Command and Conquer games are supposed to be more serious. I don't really care for them. The goofiness is so fun, though. Command and Conquer 4 was the last numbered entry, and it was- Red Alert, that one, yeah, Red Alert, Uprising, or whatever, that was one of those. That was a great game. Yeah, great. They really kind of changed up the whole resource gathering thing in favor of more like managing and capturing different control points, and it, it just didn't feel the same. And It, it looks like Halo like Wars. It didn't for a lot of people. That being said, it's an okay game. If you look at reviews, you know, it's got a lot of sevens across the board. Not a total complete disaster or anything like that. A lot of sevens across the board when it comes to game reviewers, like mainstream game reviewers like your IGNs, all that means is this game either could be okay or it is completely dog shit. If a game is completely dog shit, but it still functions correctly, they'll just give it a seven and be like, mm, it 
looks okay and it, you know it works i guess that but i feel like there's a lot we can dive into with just like the main command and conquer games uh how the red alert games change things up like there's a lot of nuances here but ultimately the bottom line is that four was just four and then too many people the rts genre started to kind of lose steam at least with mainstream popularity they're still out there people really play them and love them but they don't quite i don't know if that's off. true because this was around the same time that halo wars released and people loved halo wars i loved halo wars and you got the total war series which has always been popular you got like Civ. you've got uh age of empires those were all like pretty popular I am back. Why didn't you pause the stream? You lied. Oh shit, sorry dude. In terms of mainstream sales like they used to. And I think EA unfortunately realized that they're always the first to bail on stuff. And in this oh, case, Oh EA, that's why. That's why I died. Okay. Conquer. Next over at number seven, we have sense. Castlevania Lords of Shadows 2. Now this released in 2014 and it's what? actually technically like the last new entry in the series in almost 10 years. And that sucks because they were kind of onto something with the original, I mean, depending on who. There are so many Castlevania games that I had never knew existed. Oh my God, there are so many Castlevania games. Who you ask? It definitely took a lot of stuff and threw it to the wayside from classic Castlevania games, but it was a cool refresh. It was very of the time, kind of a God of War style game, but with cool vampires and the Belmonts and all that stuff you expect. But Castlevania Lord of Shadows 2 kind of took it even further with you playing as Dracula, with you being the bad guy. And that was something that ended up being a cool twist in the first game. And then in the second game, it kind of went hokey. It kind of jumped the shark a little bit. Uh, there's parts where it's in a- How do you jump the shark when you're playing as Dracula, the Lord of the Night? the vampire demon lord. <laughs> what could you possibly do that makes you jump the shark in that scenario? World, And it just very much was more a video game of the time, a 2014 game, you know? Cheesy cutscenes, over the top characters. This is the prequel events. to Mobius. I personally like that stuff, but not always for Castlevania. And while it was cute for Lord of Shadows, uh, it was not as good for the second one. It didn't review as well as the first game. And ultimately I think that couple- The also did well though. Konami was just being Konami at the time. and really we're kind of stepping away from games. That was it. Castlevania, I don't think is dead forever. I think we're going to see more of it soon. I really hope so. I really think it's time for this thing to return full speed ahead, but I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Doesn't Konami just make pachinko machines now, basically? They make Yu-Gi-Oh and pachinko machines and they're like, damn, they're raking it in. They make so much money. Next over at number six, we have Dead Rising 4. Now let's- Oh no, this is sad. A little bit. The original Dead I can't Rising believe they made this game. revolutionary. It was just so cool and creative and a really good spin on an almost like George Romero style zombie game uh, with a good Capcom Japanese spin to it. It was created. Dead Rising was so good because in a sea of zombie games, uh, there was so many zombie games releasing, but there was a 10 year period where there was like five zombie games releasing every single month, a ridiculous amount, but most of them were all serious and gritty. They had your Call of Duty zombies mode, but this one was just goofy. This one was just funny. They tried to have a good time with it. And that's why it was so good. It was challenging, it was stress inducing, and it was also technically very impressive. For a lot of people, if you ask some of us, that first game was truly special and uh, the series never really quite reached the same height since. It was all- No, downhill. two is good, now, two, is, two is good. Kind of continued the thing added some things and it was all right. But then by three, the game started to lose its identity. I'm gonna be honest. I thought Dead Rising 4 was this one. The gritty one, the gritty realism one, where you were like a mechanic and everything was like dark and sad. I thought that was four. So if this isn't four, then what is four? So 2016's Dead Rising the hell is 4 this? was supposed to be kind of like the 2016. You were once again playing as Frank, the beloved classic character, and the guy from the first one, right? Shopping mall Christmas time spin. Like you weren't just in a shopping mall. There was a lot more to it, but still. Seems like it was gonna have some callbacks to the first one and be a good time. Unfortunately though, uh, the game was not received Ooh, very well at Oh my all. God. Now, full disclosure, I played it. I thought it was all right. I didn't think it was the best in the series, but I certainly didn't hate it by any means. They tried to bring back the goofiness and they failed. What happened to it? Why did it have such bad user reviews? It had 4.8 on user reviews and it had the dreaded seven on critic reviews because if you release a game and it functions and it looks okay, you get a seven at the very least. Uh, but for most people, they were checked out of the series at this point. I guess we just lost faith. I think that ultimately the bottom line is that they just kept 
watering down what Dead Rising was from game to game. And by four, it had really dried up. I mean, it that was no another psychos? open world oh, game uh, in a sea of them uh, when a lot of other games were kicking ass that year. I mean, 2016 was the year that like Hitman started to kind of roll out. The new Hitman, uh, Doom was blowing people away. So Dead Rising just kind of came like a fart in the wind. Ultimately, it seemingly flopped for Capcom and that's really all we've heard about Dead Rising since. That was 2016. We're pretty far out from that. I expect good old Frank West to be dragged out for something at some point, but not a new mainline game anytime soon. That's so sad. I feel like Dead Rising 3 was the actual game that killed the series because it just took it in a completely different direction that everybody was like, eh, this is not that great. And then they tried to roll, roll it back and then they removed a bunch of stuff that made Dead Rising good in the first place. But they were like, oh no, 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 it's goofy again. Look, we got the original character. Isn't that cool? We're like in a shopping mall again. But it was just a bad version of the first game. And then everyone was like, nah, we're checked out. We're done now. Next over at number five, we have Fear 3. Now, let's roll it back again. The original Fear was absolutely revolutionary. It was an incredibly tense, technically impressive first person shooter with compelling enemies, some challenge, and also just, it was surprisingly scary. It had some really, really good scares to it. Fear was the best shooting that I'd ever seen in a game. The way that people react when you shoot them, they kind of ragdoll, they get hit in certain areas, there's like a proper reaction. It was so cool to shoot people in that game. I don't know about the rest of the game. It's though. kind of continued with Fear 2, but at that point, the developer publisher had really smelled the money and Fear 3 released in 2011, and really it was a shadow of its former self. If you compare Fear 3 to the first game, it's like being on a different planet. Fear 3 just was very much of the time, a very 2011 ass game with corny cutscenes, weird cheesy characters, dumb over the top moments, uh, shoehorned co-op elements that, yeah, you can say that some of those elements were actually kind of creative, but still, it wasn't really what Fear was. It's so hard to get multiplayer to work right in any kind of game that you think even remotely has a chance of scaring you because when you're playing with someone else, there's no chance that things are gonna scare you. I mean, a lot of horror games do have co-op co or multiplayer, and it does work sometimes, but most of the time, you're not gonna be scared if you're with a friend. If you're goofing it up, if you tell them some jokes, you, you're not taking it as seriously as you would if you're in the room by yourself with the lights off and it's nighttime at 3 a.m. and you're calling Kermit the Frog at 3 a.m. with J Station. And bottom line, it wasn't scary at all. I don't really know what they were thinking with this game to just go so far in a different direction and after being like, oh, that's what people like. You just totally flip the franchise on its head. OK, it wasn't like a creative risk or anything. It felt totally half assed. And interestingly enough, the game actually has OK reviews. If you look at the Metacritic, I mean, like the review scores are eh, OK. Uh, and the user scores, the actual fan scores are much lower. People. This reminds me of Resident Evil 6. Everything he is saying is just breathing Resident Evil 6. They took it, they turned everything on its head, they made everything corny, they made it a super duper shooter, probably with co-op as well, and it was completely against what the series is usually about, and it wasn't scary, and it came out in that similar time frame. It gives Resident Evil 6. We're really burned by this one, and uh, I don't know if we're gonna see fear ever again. That was just like a special point in time. Resident Man, Evil revitalized though. game is just magic. Now down to number four, oh, don't get me started on this one. I take this oh, Always pissed. Extremely personally, it's Always Sim pissed. City. The 2013 game just simply titled Sim City was kind of like the harbinger of what was to come with the problems with modern games and specifically a lot of the stuff that EA pulled. The lead up to Sim City 2013 felt big. The screenshots, the videos, everything coming out, the game looked absolutely massive and incredible and it seemed like Max's- This was the first video game release controversy that I saw online, and it was hilarious. EA had gone off the deep end. They released SimCity, and it was dog war. Either it was glitchy, or it was lacking the features that it required, but Sims individuals were pissed. And I feel like it's so hard to get the Sims fan base to be mad at something. You have to really be absolutely insane. You have to money grub so hard to get the Sims fan base, which is usually like 20 to 40 year old women 
that just want to sit here and play a nice video game for a while to be pissed at something. EA were really going for it. It was seemingly going to be more dynamic, more detailed, uh, with more zoning, way more options, uh, just a kind of different gameplay style, a whole new engine. And like critically, at face value, some critics thought it was alright, but unfortunately, oh my wasn't God. actually released to mainstream audiences. Uh, the game hit a lot of problems. It was technically an absolute mess. It was buggy, it was messy, it was all over the place, and it also was one of the earlier games that were considered always online. And it was a game that you'd pretty much be playing the always online controversies too. Oh, that was when the Xbox One first originally came out and everyone said, oh, you're gonna have to play all your games online. It's gonna be always online all the time. And everyone was so pissed at that. People were not happy. And that combined with the fact that it was buggy and messy on release, lacking all the features that were required. It was a recipe for disaster. And it was so fun to watch. I had absolutely no draw, no connection to The Sims whatsoever. Never played a Sims game. Don't care about Sims. Watching it unfold was just, it was funny. It was hilarious. I feel bad for some of the developers that work on this, but I don't feel bad for the suits that got yelled at for this one because it flooped, because it flopped so hard. By yourself, but EA wanted you to be connected to the internet. And the problem was when SimCity launched, there were a bunch of network outages. So it was just kind of like a huge perfect storm disaster. There was tons of crashing. You'd be sitting around waiting for the game to load, to connect to EA servers. Uh, people were actually losing their saves. And this was, was when you had like to have an online pass launch. to play games as well, right? Game release launches are bad, uh, SimCity 2013 really kind of paved the way. This was like an early games as a service game. They wanted you online, they wanted you playing, and they wanted to keep updating the game constantly. And the game and sucked. And keep playing SimCity forever. And you know what? That's admirable, but it didn't hit. Technically, it was way too early for this type of content delivery, and oh, no. the other developers showed how to do it right. I mean, this- <laughs> You know, it sounds like they're saying that, you know, SimCity was just too ahead of its time. <laughs> they were just too visionary. They just didn't have the technology required to execute their fantastic dream yet. It was too of its time. We weren't ready for SimCity yet. City Skyline games and all their expansions are great. They have a great player base, a community, people that buy into these things because it's done right. SimCity 2013 wasn't. And at this point now, uh, what Two happened years after, after technically it got a shut down. section of Maxis closed down in 2015 and that was cited for the reason. And SimCity now at this point is kind of just reduced to mobile game whateverness. Whateverness? Oh, I don't that's know. sad. Whateverness is SimCity 2013, if you ask God. Next Damn, what a disaster. Three, we have Saints Row. Yeah, the No! This may be the saddest one on the list because Saints Row was such a good series. When the first one came out, everyone was like, damn, this is goofy GTA, and it's a lot of fun. I can run around and hit people with dildos. That's awesome. Then Saints Row 2 came out, and people were like, oh my god, this is the GOAT. Now we have GTA, and we have Saints Row. And then it just went downhill from there. Saints Row 3 came out, people were like, hmm, this isn't as good as Saints Row 2, but it's still pretty good. I can see the fun in this. I can enjoy myself. And then Saints Row 4 completely went off the deep end. It took the goofiness and turned it off to 7 billion and 2. People were like, hmm, that's a little bit too goofy. And it went on hiatus for a bit. And when it came back, Reboot was a pretty rough game. Uh, we reviewed it, we put out a before you buy video, and we were not fans. It was technically an absolute mess, but also it lost so much of the humor and charm that the original games had. Say what you will about them, some people love them, some people hate them, some people like the early ones, some people- The dialogue in the reboot was insanely cringe. They were getting together as a gang and they're like, hey, what do you want to hit? And the, the other person's like, I don't know, I just have to pay off my student loans. They're trying to so hard to be relatable to the the TikTok generation. It physically hurt to watch some of these cutscenes. People like the later ones, but Saints Row 3 tried to make all those people happy and uh, ultimately made none of them happy. The game was absolutely completely lifeless, devoid of charm. It had a cool city, but the stuff you did in it wasn't very fun. It was glitchy and all the characters that you hung out with were shockingly annoying. The game very quickly, publicly failed to meet expectations of the holding company uh, Embrace. And it was group. glitchy and as well. After that, Volition the developers who had been developing the games since the beginning got absorbed into parts of Gearbox Entertainment. And it's worth pointing out that Saints Row at a point oh had my like days. a 60 on Metacritic and like a two and a half on user score. And Jesus Christ. Developers, they actually supported it post-launch. They put out a little bit of stuff, but 
ultimately nobody cared. It's such a shame. Because like I said, whether you like the early ones, whether you like the later ones when they went totally crazy, the Saints Row games were special. They were cool for a lot of people for a variety of different reasons, and Saints Row 2022 seemingly will quickly be forgotten by most people. Hey, if you had fun with it, that's you. We're not gonna judge you. I'm willing to bet that most people had forgotten about this game about two weeks after it came out. I'm willing to bet that if you asked the average gamer how many Saints Row games there are about two weeks after this game came out, they would say this full. Everyone forgot about it. But it doesn't seem like Volition is making another one anytime soon, and they were good developers for a very long time, and it's a shame. Knocking them down. It looks like Right to Hell Retribution on this. Reload! Damn, Reload! damn, damn, damn. What a cry in shame. Ah! Doesn't looks look fun. Okay, this looks like a great set. time. Here on out, observe and report. Now, coming down to number two, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Yeah, that was the last one. When was the last time you thought about Marvel vs. Capcom? When was the last time you thought about Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite? Well, the sixth mainline entry in the series, uh, which was released in 2017, just pissed off a lot of players, and there was just a lot of bad PR floating around about it. I mean, sp It feels like fighting game players are the easiest to annoy. I always see fighting game players being constantly angry all of the time. Whereas, The Sims players seem like they're really hard to annoy, or like Animal Crossing, Fan base seems like they're really hard to annoy. Fighting games are always a conduit for hate. Everyone is always so angry when they play fighting games, which makes sense because playing fighting games themselves is so rage inducing. Specifically with what we've talked about with a lot of games in this video, uh, a lot of the core elements of Marvel vs. Capcom were diluted, watered down, stuff was taken away, and ultimately the game was considered playing it safe. Now, as someone who's not an experienced fighting game fan, I found it kind of just cool to pick up and play and punch some people, but the hardcore fighting game community, man, these games live and die by those people, and if they're not happy, that's it for the game. And that was the case with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Not to mention all the other stuff that they pulled with this, uh, like certain locked characters, microtransaction stuff. I believe a really crappy of collector's course. edition that a lot of people- <laughs> No! That's the Infinity Stones? Oh my God, what an insult! Collector's editions are usually absolute tripe. It's complete trollop. You should never buy a collector's edition. There's usually never anything good with them. If you like the game that much, just buy two versions and give one to a friend so that more people can experience it. Don't buy a collector's edition. It's completely pointless. But this is just an insult. In fact, no, you deserve it. <laughs> you deserve it. It's like the Fallout 76 tote bag that they were supposed to get. And it was, it was made out to be this really sick bag. and It was really high quality. And when they got it, it was basically a plastic bag that you can get from Asda. Well, they got ripped off. There's a lot to this one in the news cycles, but ultimately the game just kind of came and went. The infinity and that's eggs. How these go. Are we going to see glow. another Marvel versus Capcom at any point? I don't know. It seems like Marvel is really down to clown with some cool video games again. So maybe, but it has certainly been a while. Marvel versus Capcom has been dead since Infinite. Now, yeah, the bags are moldy one, too. We have Driver 3, or Driver uh, 3. Like call it Driv 3R. Yes, this was the time where we were putting the numbers in the titles of the games and movies. This was very normal at the time, if I'm being totally honest. But still, Driver 3 followed up a pretty fantastic series. The original game was completely unique for the original PlayStation, and Driver 2 kind of oh, introduced some like open world, get out of your car type elements, and they really felt like they were on. Wait, something. you can get out of this car? That's crazy. I have heard that the Driver games are absolutely fantastic, and I have not heard about them since. It is so hard to keep things like fighting game series and racing game series alive. Anything that's a car base is so hard to keep alive. The only thing that I can think of that is alive to this day is like Forza and maybe like Need for Speed. Does Need for Speed even still make games? Does Gran Turismo still make games? Because there's such a small amount of people that actually want to play these games that you have to make it mwah, chef's kiss, spot on. But after after that, the rise oh, of Oh, except for Mario Kart. Mario Kart's a given. Yeah, Mario Kart's always going to be popular. Driver 3 really was kind of chasing at that game's heels. There was a time when we had like Grand Theft Auto Vice City, but then also 2004's Driv 3R. And I mean, if you compare the two, yikes. I mean, where Driver is a little bit more realistic and like a little bit more gritty with some cool car mechanics and physics and stuff like that, uh, it was still a total mess. I mean, the shooting, the third person. What is this? It was totally lame. The game was a Okay, this mess, looks like- A lot of people didn't really care. A uni project. Auto ultimately ate its lunch. Why, yeah, why would you ever play this when Grafathor exists? God, how depressing. What do you think about those terrible video games that killed their franchises? Any other video game franchises that have died recently? Let me know in the comment section.